Welcome everyone to the Age Changers Show, and it is our mission and vision to elevate the church so that we can see our identity in Christ through the framework of God's eternal purpose. We also desire to equip the church to live with an eternal perspective as we pursue our upward call in Christ. And finally, we desire to empower God's people to live out their lives in faith-filled obedience. And we want to encourage you through these episodes and through this podcast to be able to do that. Well, we have been on a series where we've been talking about uh, the continued work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church in our day. And we are, we started out in a broad way and we are narrowing our focus because we, we do not want to just talk about how the ministry of the Holy Spirit is ongoing in our generation, but we want to talk specifically about a topic that is somewhat controversial, and that is, are there modern day apostles and prophets? And for some of us, um, uh, that are watching this, that issue has been settled. We believe that all of the gifts and the graces of Christ are still active and Jesus as the head of the church is still sending forth grace to his church in um, all manner of uh, diverse gifts and graces in which he has enriched his church with. But we want to, again, provide a biblical foundation for that belief. Are there apostles today? Are there prophets today? And I just want to make one clarifying comment as we uh, continue to race towards that objective to uh, show from the Word of God that there are apostles today. And we want to see what the apostolic grace and are there prophets today and and what the prophetic grace looks like because as we shared in a previous episode we want to be able to interact and cooperate with those graces to be able to receive the impartation that they bring to the church and so that the work of god the grace of god the empowerment of God through that grace can have its maximum effect within the body of Christ. Jesus said, if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, in other words, in the way a a prophet is sent to you, we receive a prophet's reward, the reward of the prophet. If you just receive someone as a teacher, you receive them in the way and the manner in which you want to define them, it limits the impact that their impartation and their grace can have on your life. This is not just about apostolic ministry and prophetic ministry. It it applies to every uh, single sent one where God has called and sent forth ministry gifts to function in a ministry role in the church. I've seen many, many pastors struggle in locations where they are sent on assignment to serve. And because they're not received by the church, that is the receiving church, because they don't like the, how the gift is wrapped based upon the personality or the ministry style uh, of that individual, they reject that person and refuse to receive them. So they're able to do some things, but they're not able to do a lot of things. Even Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God, the Messiah, went back to his own hometown, and his own hometown was offended by him. You go, well, what offended them? Well, Jesus had grown up in town. His relatives were there. You know, his aunts and uncles were there. And so he goes out into the region. He starts his public ministry, starts doing signs and wonders. They're hearing about what he's doing out there. And so when he comes back to Nazareth and stands up in the synagogue and he starts preaching and teaching, 
they notice and, and they take note that my goodness, um, this, this kid that ran our streets and that we knew grew up among us now is talking to us with an authority and a power. And, and, and you can see at first they were excited by that, but then their excitement turned into resentment. Who does he think he is uh, and, and who made him an authority to speak to us in this way? The tragedy is that the Bible says that Jesus did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. You go, well, could Jesus have done mighty works there? Yes, but because of the mercy of Jesus, Jesus didn't do greater works there because when, when God does greater things in the midst of a people, those people then are held to a higher degree of accountability and, and the, the judgment and the spiritual responsibility that we have when those greater works are seen by us and, and experienced by us, we're held to a higher degree of accountability. And so I believe the Lord restrained what he desired to do there in that moment. He went back to his hometown and he wanted to bring revival. He wanted to spiritually uh, allow God to, to express his power to heal the sick and to do mighty works, notable miracles. But because of his mercy, he restrained himself and it said that he only healed a few sick people. Now, I don't want that to be said about me or about you or even the communities in which we live. We want God to be able to do whatever God wants to do uh, in us and through us and in the regions in which we live. And I know there are a number of people that are a part of this audience that you are believing and you are contending for God's greatest and best for your, for your region, for your city, for your church. But we must be able to recognize in spiritual recognition and discernment what God is wanting to do in our day. And the way we discern what God is wanting to do, it is by who he sends to us. And so if we, you know, have a, a prejudice by, in, if somebody comes and God sends a gift to us in a, in a manner, in a way that we're uncomfortable, it doesn't fit our grid or our past experiences, God is wanting to enlarge us, stretch us, to have a faith to receive things that maybe are unique to us, different uh, than what we have known based on our, our past spiritual history. We've got to be open to the Lord. Now, we're, we're not so open-minded that our brain falls out. We are, a, we are discerning both ways. We're, we're discerning knowing that we have an enemy that would want to deceive but we also are discerning that God is on the move in our day and he's pouring out his spirit and he is he's on the move to do what he desires to do. And God is a great God and so he does great things. He wants to do more in our day than we're allowing him to do. So I want us to get that. We must you know, enlarge the capacity of our heart, which means that we've got to mature and grow our faith to be able to receive more of what the Lord has for us. And so it was their unbelief. There are two times that are mentioned in scripture where Jesus was amazed. He was amazed at the greatness of their unbelief when it came to Nazareth. But there was another time where a, a Roman soldier who was a uh, you know, not a part of the, the nation of Israel. He had no deep spiritual heritage. He didn't know much about the covenants and the promises and what God spoke to Israel. But he came to Jesus and he recognized that Jesus had authority. It's strange to see how the, the, the people that grew up with Jesus struggled with his authority and the comments and the commentary they made when Jesus was speaking to them in the synagogue was they said, where did he get 
this wisdom? Where did he get this knowledge from? And where did he get this authority? Well, you know, while we try to source where Jesus got the authority, other people recognized authority when they saw it. And so the Roman centurion said, I've got a servant that is ill. I've got a servant that is sick. And, and, and I, I love this servant and I want to see his life change. And I heard that you're a healer. Can you heal my servant? And Jesus was willing to go with him to the location of where the servant was at to minister healing to him. And the, and the centurion said to Jesus, he said, no need for you to come. Yeah, me being a military man, I understand how authority works. I, I understand that there are those that are, have higher rank and authority and they delegate an order to other smaller ranks and authority and then that order is distributed till finally the, the lowest ranking person in the military finally understands what their marching orders are. He said, I understand. You're a man of authority. You issue forth the command. I'll listen and obey it and I'll believe it. And so what happened, the Bible tells us that when Jesus heard this man's response. He said, in all the nation of Israel, a nation that is to epitomize faith and covenant trust and knowing the faithfulness of God because of a long history and heritage. He said, I've never seen faith like this in all of Israel. I believe that we're gonna see that same scenario repeated in our times. I think we're gonna see people that have never known Jesus, never grew up in church, never never ha have been well taught things that we learned all the way back in Sunday school, not familiar with every uh, bit of the content of scripture. I believe as God's spirit is being poured out, I believe there's going to be people that are saved and their innocence of faith is going to be so pure that they're gonna believe God for anything and they will hear that nothing is impossible to them that believe and they're just going to simply believe, only believe. That's why Jesus told Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, he, when he heard that his daughter had died, Jesus turned to him and in my vernacular, I'm paraphrasing, he said, don't panic, only believe. There are gonna be, be, be some people that are not just going to only analyze, only commentate, uh, you know, only scrutinize, only, you know, vet. They're going to only believe in a simplicity of devotion to Jesus. And Jesus is going to do things in them and through them and for them that is going to be mind blowing. And we're going to say, why would God do things like that for them? They have not even known the Lord for very long. It's because sometimes we can get stuck in our religious ruts in thinking that we know um, what is truth and, and, and we're very rigid in that set of doctrinal beliefs and that framework of doctrine. And, and God is only as big as our thoughts. He's only as big as our, uh, the framework of our doctrine. And, and God has a way of showing us you can't put him in a box. That was the pitfall and the problem with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They, they, they had Messiah all figured out, except when he showed up and showed off, he didn't fit within their box. And Jesus said, you know, you search the scripture from beginning to end and you in them you think, you have eternal life, but they testified about me. And in all of your, your, your study and all of your memorization, you missed me because we know that the Pharisees required all of their students uh, in the synagogue school and the Sabbath schools to memorize the first five books of the Old Testament an amazing feat for any young man that would be a student of scripture to memorize the Pentateuch. 
Well, Jesus said, you've memorized it, but there's only one problem. You missed the whole point of the memorization because you should have seen me in every page. It was about a, a, a prophecy and a foretelling about my coming. You should have recognized me, but you missed me because of how you anticipated the unfolding purpose of God. I don't want to be that in my generation. I want to allow the Holy Spirit to, to create within me a faith that believes God for all things, not just the things that are respectable or acceptable to me. I want God to be God. And I hope that that's your heart and that's your intention as we study the word of God together. And so if God is restoring the ministry of the apostle and prophet in our day, and that there is the continuation of the ongoing ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we see that God is, and we're gonna look at that in the next episode, that God is continuing to send seasons of refreshing from his presence, and they are for a purpose. The purpose is for the restoration of all things. Then we wanna cooperate with those waves of refreshing. We wanna ride the wave. We wanna engage it. We wanna embrace it. We want it to carry us where God is attempting to take the church because God is taking the church somewhere. And I want to go where he is taking us. And I love that phrase in Revelation where it describes the 120,000. Uh, it said they followed the lamb, those that had the seal of God in their forehead. It said they followed the lamb wherever he went. I wanna be a follower of the lamb. I want to go where he wants me to go and I want him to take me where he wants to take me. Now, I realize that we have not gotten into some of the content of the teaching. This has been more of an exhortation, but I have wanted to share some of the motivation of why this type of content is important. It's about us embracing and receiving it's about us believing uh, and, and interacting in our faith for what God wants to do in our day. And one of the things that he is doing is he's doing a work of the restoration of the fivefold ministry. Not just that we, we go, okay, um, I can believe that, that he is restoring and, and that there could be some guys that... Uh, and, and individuals that are apostles and prophets in our day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's so that we recognize them when they are sent to us and that they have the ability to freely give and that we have the ability to fully receive so that we receive the reward of their labors among us as God sends them to us in our generation and not just apostles and prophets, but evangelists, pastors, and teachers as well. All right, bless you guys. Thank you for joining me. In the next session, we will get right into it, uh, continue to talk about uh, what God, in a, in a, in a 30,000 foot view, why the restoration of the fivefold ministry is important, and, and kind of the goal of God as he moves the church to a place of maturity, why it's so important to cooperate with these graces. Bless you, love you, thank you for joining me, bye.